the upgrading for Kambi Motor was uh, driven by the community uh, that was residing there because from their initial agitation to get the land, they realized that for them to have good living environment, the environment had to be improved. So the upgrading was actually sort of like uh, something driven by the community themselves. So when we went on board, we then the organization that was coordinating this was Pomoja Trust, and they were in charge of the social process works on the ground. That's about mobilization of communities and uh, assisting communities to set priorities. So when it, it came to the need for technical people to resolve the designs and the spaces that the communities wanted, that's when we went on board. So basically, at that point, when we started off with Kambimoto, I think a lot of issues were great in the sense that they weren't sure of what they wanted, basically. And um, the, the, the process was um, what I would call a bottom-up process in the sense that all the ideas emanated from the community itself. For us, it was just uh, a task to you know, put the community thinking into frame in, in, in regards to technical requirements, yeah? So basically that was the starting point when we engaged with Cambi Motor at the onset. The dreaming process had certain uh, clear stages that we went through. The first one was, like I said, just to mobilize the community and bring them together to set priorities in terms of what they want to realize in the design of their spaces. And um, during the mobilization, of course, there were a lot of issues because you would find that not everybody is on the same page and a number of people would then find it difficult to you know, agree on a common ground. But through the facilitation of the, what then we call the social team, they were able to sit down and agree on priority areas. And uh, for Kambimoto specifically, I think they were clear from the beginning that housing was the biggest priority in as much as there were other priorities that, or rather other needs that would follow. So we started off engaging on the basis of provision of housing. And um, after the mobilization, we had sessions that we were involved in where we discussed with the community on one-to-one -one, and they were able to say, look, this is what you want. And at that point, really, the parameters for engagement were very basic in the sense that uh, we would even just engage on sketches that the communities were making. They would scribble some sketches. And again, for those who couldn't conceptualize sketches, we had an opportunity to even use rudimentary uh, methods like pacing out. They would sort of like pace out and say three steps by four steps, that becomes my room. And beyond that, of course, they also sketched on the ground itself, and this was to scale. They would sketch it out to scale and say, look, this is the expanse of my space. So we collected that information and started synthesizing it. Of course, as part of collecting that information, there was um, an occasion of uh, you know, collecting raw data from the ground in terms of measuring out the settlement. And tied to that was also the enumeration of the residents in the community just to know how many people there are. So that then when we are designing, we could match the numbers to the space available. So that uh, process went hand in hand. And at the end of it, we went into another consultative session where we took back the information and said, look, you this number of people, and this is the amount of space you have, and then this is the dream you have. So we were able now to look at all the realities on that table and say, look, if you want this kind of a house and you're this number of people, then it's not possible. We need to, mod to, to modify the house to fit the people who are there. And at that point, I remember the biggest challenge was actually to agree on the amount of space that we could provide. Some of the initial dreams from the community were really broad. 
Some envisioned having cars and they were providing for car parks. Others said, why don't you have a swimming pool like the upscale urban population? And in their sketches, they put even swimming pools. But now, tying the reality of the space available and um, the people that needed to be accommodated. And also in addition to that, as part of uh, just mobilizing the people, uh, there was a process of initiating savings. Part of the savings were to go into the house construction. So we had also to consider the cost of the house and how much people can afford to put up the house. So we brought all these realities you know, out in a common forum and the community was able now to get convinced that we need to scale down with our dream. But again, the process of scaling down the dream was undertaken by them. We just put the reality on the table and they scaled down their dream. And one of the challenging issues with Kambi Moto was that everybody wanted a claim on the ground in the sense that we could not stack them one on top of the other, like in apartments. So everybody wanted space on the ground because uh, from the initial agitation for ownership of the land, people had really struggled to have a claim of a portion of, of the land that they were occupying. So again, the design had to be modified, again, with the input of the community to ensure that everybody has a claim on the ground. So we had this series of meetings that uh, we used now to process all this information and get uh, the the design uh, working. But again, the design process had its own stages. Like I say, the initial stage was that one of just basic negotiation, of course, preceded by the gathering of information. So when we negotiated and we felt like the design was working, we had an opportunity now to present it, not just to the community itself, but to other people from without the community. And that presentation was a ceremony in itself. So we had to put up what we were calling then a cloth model, which is a model of the house at scale one-to-one -one on a timber frame, but enclosed with cloth. And the purpose for this exercise was to ensure that both the residents and the neighbors, and partly also the uh, city administration, was able to uh, understand at scale one to one, what we were thinking of in terms of uh, the envisioned housing for Kambimoto. So, again, the cloth model exercise was part of you know uh, mobilization. Now at a different scale, because we had undertaken the mobilization of the people at the settlement level, we were moving out, and we had to now bring on board the neighbors around the settlement and also the city administration. So during that event, then, then the then mayor of the city was invited to come and grace the occasion. And partly was also to ensure that we had some you know, space in terms of negotiating for the uh, adoption of the plans and approval of the plans for construction. So after now that cloth model exercise, we prepared technical drawings that we submitted to the urban authorities and we submitted this on the strength of a certain provision that had been put in the council minutes or in the urban authority minutes that allowed for special planning area. And with the special planning area, there was going to be a waiver on the requirements that are standard for approval of plans. So we got a waiver in the sense that Ultimately, when we had finished the design process, our house was slightly smaller than what can pass for standard approvals. And again, even in terms of layout of the settlement, we are going to go for higher densities than what the planning authorities approve uh, in that area. So on the strength of the special planning uh, minute that was within the council uh, of the urban authorities, we presented our drawings. And uh, again, that exercise was, was also another um, sort of like, I uh, would call it mobilization exercise in the sense that initially we had dealt with the political um, uh, component of the urban administration. 
Now we are dealing with the technical component of the urban administration. So we had to take them through the process of understanding how this program would work. And that took a long time. But because of uh, lack of clarity on a number of areas, they initially gave us provisional approval to proceed with the program. And they would then look at what we've done on the ground and use that as a basis to grant full approval. So we worked a lot on Kabimoto on provisional approval. So after now presenting the drawings, we were allowed to start construction on that provisional approval. And when we started construction, we also noticed that the construction itself was going to be another design process because a lot of issues were not clear in the previous stage. So I remember when we started construction, we had to do a demonstration of how furniture would move into the house because we had provided for this door that the community felt like was small. So we put the door frame and we said, look, can you bring the biggest size of furniture you've got and arrange it inside, long before even the roof was in place. So they found that quite interesting and they would just come around to experience the house as it was coming up. Now, when we started the construction, there was uh, another opportunity to train the community on construction methods. And we partnered with another organization that had competence on training for construction. And they came on the ground and trained the community for construction. Uh, this, I think now they go by the name Practical Action. That time it was the Intermediate Technology Development Group. So they came on the ground, passed on that knowledge on construction uh, skills. And in addition to that also, because of the wider partnership between the community and other communities out there, they got a visitation of some groups from India who came and also had peer exchanges on construction skills. So they trained them specifically for the building elements, for the slab. That technology actually was brought in from India. And we benefited because one of the senior architects involved in this program had worked in India and was able also to coordinate that transfer of skill from India. Of course, with the benefit of the other players who were involved in the program. So now after starting the construction, I think uh, we had to make it fully participatory in the sense that when we started the construction process, we constituted teams from the community that were charged with overseeing certain tasks in the construction. We had um, a team that was calling itself the construction committee or team that would then meet occasionally to review the progress of the construction. And this is the team that I personally worked with and we scheduled for meetings, sort of like on a weekly basis, where we would sit down and in a participatory manner, go through the records, see what materials were delivered, and then also get an update of uh, the uh, progress of the project construction. So at the beginning, it was quite demanding in terms of just the time out there and dealing with the community. But again, very interesting, because the community was very receptive and willing to learn. So we worked with them. Uh, sort of like on a daily basis in as much as the meetings would come after a week. One of the things we considered in this program was to work incrementally. Incrementally because of lack of resources, or rather not lack of resources, but limitation in terms of how, many or how much resources we had. So we had to start off doing just a simple room on the ground that had capacity to take some extra two rooms on top. And, um, the idea was that you start off small, so you reach out to many people, but to also allow individuals to contribute the little they have to be able to engage with the program. Again, in terms of incremental construction, we didn't want anybody displaced from the community. So there was an arrangement that for those who would start with the giving up their space for construction, they would be absorbed by their neighbors in the settlement. So we avoided clearing the whole settlement, so we had to phase it out and do it incrementally, even in terms of rolling out the units on the ground. So 
that, that was the key consideration when we started off with the construction. And then because of uh, using a precast concrete approach for the floor elements, we had also, uh, or rather we had to put up a yard or a workshop where they would then put up these elements. And that went hand in hand with the in situ construction. So that limited also on the amount of time that we were to take to put up a single unit. So the first cluster we started off was 34 units. And 34 units, I think, took about, um, if I remember, well, is it a year plus or thereabouts? But then when we finished with the 34, there was a lot of um, experience that had been gained. So when we went next, we started 27 units. And 27 units, we did them in a record six months. And to us, that was good because it was a learning process. And we had perfected on a few things. But as we went on, we kept modifying and teaching the design a bit to be able to meet the, the, the needs of the community. Because at some point, we noticed that um, the, the, there were issues we had overlooked. Like I'll point out, we had not factored in for the physically disabled in the initial design. Because in the initial design, we had put the rooms upstairs, the bedrooms. So we had to modify that and create an opportunity for a bedroom downstairs just to be able to accommodate those who are physically disabled. And also in addition to that, those who are you know, aged and could not walk up the staircase. So in fact, in the first cluster, we came up with two units that would then uh, take care of the physically disabled and also those who are aged and could not use the staircase. And uh, the other thing we modified along the way was just the organization of the space inside. I think we changed a few things, even in terms of material usage. We started off using a certain type of stone that was going to be too expensive for them. But then on the advice of the engineer, we changed and used a different stone that was pretty affordable to the community at that time. Uh, so after rolling out the second cluster, I think, we went to a third cluster, and um, by the time we were getting to a third, the third cluster, I think the community was pretty much empowered and were beginning even to request that they be released to do the construction by themselves without necessarily having to rely on uh, the entire support. There was also the question of how we would then accommodate uh, the people who are not necessarily tenants, the structure owners, because the structure owners didn't need a facility to put up their houses. For most of the uh, community uh, members, they were contributing some money towards the construction of their house. I think at the start it was about 10%, so they would put in 10%, and then they, they're given 90% from the common uh, fund that was set up to support the house construction. Yeah, so that's it basically in terms of uh, how we went about the design process. Again, let me point out that the design process for Kambimoto was never separate from the construction process. And again, like we noticed later, it was also tied to the occupation of the house. So the design process was continuous. It didn't break at one point. We kept designing from the start, even when we were constructing, and even when they were putting up, I mean, they were living in the houses, we noticed they were modifying things. And we learned a lot from that. So I would say the design process for Kambimoto has been a continuous engagement. I think even up to date, they are still designing their place.